You're listening to the Gabe Molina Podcast. I already pushed the record button, man. So, Benny Cantu, what's going on, brother? What's up, man? Good man, to be I'm, here. I'm really excited that you called me and you wanted to do a podcast. Yeah. The uh, problem is you called me and I was uh, taking a shit this morning. <laughs> and uh, you said something that blew my mind. He said, "Cut it off and wipe deep." <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, that really that really resonated with me, man. Yeah, cut it short and wipe deep, man. <laughs> so they tell us in the army. <laughs> to, today's a today's a big day. That's all right. Today's a, a big day for uh, I guess us as uh, individuals and as a country, right? September 11th, right? And uh, that's something that uh, it's very interesting because uh, I put a picture up today and. And uh, I put it together last night, and I was kind of half debating if I wanted to do it because there's uh, one of the images was one of the gentlemen jumping out of the building, right? Right. And uh, I was thinking about it. I was, man, it's 20 years ago, you know? Yeah. And 20 years is a long time. It's enough for a generation to be born that wasn't there. Exactly. You know? And so uh, I ended up posting it, and uh, I don't know. Part of me was kind of being a wuss about it, and part of me was kind of like, well, it's the reality of what happened, you know. And exactly. I told my wife, I said, uh, uh, one of the things I guess that sticks with me so much was watching a video of uh, some uh, firefighters. I guess they had made a uh, headquarter or whatever off in the little area or whatever. Right. Uh, I'm going to cough real quick. <coughs> and uh, there's they're under a canopy, and mm-hmm. you keep hearing this massive just smash right and then smash and the news is recording them and there's the chief of uh, fire marshal whatever i don't know what they are i don't right. know the rankings or anything but and he keeps he putting his hand on his head like jeez and they ask him what is that and he said they're jumping you know and that was one thing that just kind of floored me right, right. when you're watching the whole thing play out you're just kind of like it seems like a movie, right? Mm-hmm. It's two buildings that you see in movies all the time, and and you know you see the plane fly into it, and it but you're not grasping what's happening. At least for me, till that kind of happened. You're trying you know, to register it all. It, it's not registering mm-hmm. right till, till that starts happening. And uh, you know, I was taking a math class in uh, UTSA, and I'm you know, you know stupid <laughs> country kids, right? So <coughs> this girl who I was cheating off of. She's uh, not you, Gabe. No, I was terrible in that <laughs> class, man. I, I, I was, if when I run out of toes and fingers, I'm done counting, man. And uh, so I remember going, uh, uh, plane flew in Twin Towers, right? Or I'm from Georgia, Texas. Mm-hmm. To me, a tower is radio tower, right? You know, something out in the middle of the, the cornfield or out in the middle of the pasture. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, it's a big deal. Yeah. And so she's listening and she's like, a, a, one of the towers fell. And I'm I'm thinking of this, you know, metal structure with red lights all over it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I, okay, I don't understand. And uh, I went to later on that I, I got a, to see a TV, and I was like, oh. And then I realized what they were talking about. Then it hit you, yeah. What were you doing when uh, when this was going on? I was in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I you were already in the military? I was already in the service, yeah. And uh, we had actually got done doing some PT that morning. And one of my buddies had told me, a, um, one of my good friends, uh, Johnny Rubio, uh, putting him on blast. Uh, <laughs> had said, you just you just had gotten in the military? Or had you been for a while? I had already been there. I joined in '99, and then um, okay. So a couple of years later, obviously, when it happened. So I had met Rubio when we went to Maps in San Antonio when you first enlist, and it was kind of crazy because when I met him at Maps, you know, you see a lot of people at Maps. You're like, man, I'm never going to see this guy again. You know, whatever. Yeah. You stay the night, you get up the next morning, you do physicals, crawl around in your underwear and all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just, I saw him, he saw me, and we just, whatever. He said, I'm from Corpus. I said, I'm from George West. He said, I know where it's at. We pass through there all the time. So we got done with the maps, and uh, he ended up going to basic training, same place I went to. We went to boot camp. We went to South Carolina and uh, got done there. And then we both ended up going to Fort Eustis, Virginia. For our AIT is for the you know your training for the actual job you're going to be doing while you're in the service. What was your what was your job? I was a mechanic and crew chief, okay. and a door gun on a Black Hawk. You had mm. sixty Black Hawks. So. Oh, okay, 
And uh, so we spent time in Fort Eustis, Virginia. And then we both ended up going to Fort Bragg in North Carolina. So uh, we became real good friends. And when that happened, when September 11th happened, we had had PT that morning. And he's like, hey, come over to the house. My wife's going to make some chorizo and egg for breakfast. You know what I mean? You live in those parts of the States. Mm-hmm. People, don't, you know, people don't know what chorizo and egg is. I don't you even know, know how it. you got it over there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think they got it shipped over there from his family. But anyways, so I was like, yeah, why not? So I went over to his house for breakfast that morning. And his wife had just got done making breakfast. And uh, so we're sitting there watching TV. And all of a sudden, that alert comes out on the TV and on the screen. And you can see that first plane that actually goes in and starts it hits that that tower and uh like you said you just everybody was just you know what's going on what you know what just happened and uh, since we were at in fort bragg it's a rapid deployment unit you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying it, it they they want to be somewhere if they if they have to go somewhere it's they have to be ready to deploy you know in case something like this was you know something like that happened and sure enough as soon as that happened, the phone starts ringing. Well, not cell phones at that time. You know, everybody had the yeah. house phone. So uh, they started calling us up, started locking us down, started locking the bases. You know, they started going to uh, high security alerts. People couldn't get in off base. It was taking families eight hours to just get on the base where they lived. If you wanted to go to the commissary where it's like a grocery store. <clears throat> um, so it was immediate that the security right was away, wrenched gave, up? Right away. Right um, away. And then you had people just on alert already getting ready to deploy, you know, 18, you know, around the world in 18 hours. You know? So, yeah, it, it was it was something that was crazy. I mean, and it was to me, it was one of those things where it was a bad day. But it's it was kind of tough because it's my oldest daughter's birthday. It's her mm-hmm. birthday, today, September 11th. Oh, know? wow. So well, happy birthday to her. Yeah. So it's Kendra's birthday. You know, happy birthday to Kendra. She's out there you're listening, putting her on blast, too. <laughs> but uh, she's 25. Jeez, we're getting old, <laughs> Benny. You're getting old. No, we're both getting old. I, uh, I don't know if nobody's told you, but. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, that was my, that's where I was at. And everybody says, like, where were you at, you know, when, you know, the older people, when JFK, you know, was assassinated. They can remember that. You know, for us down here in South Texas, where were you at when Selena got killed? You know, I was watching all the heavy set Mexicanas cry in the <laughs> behind the high school. <laughs> yeah, I was actually. I think me and Dion had just skipped school and we were coming back from Bibio when we heard it on the radio. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And his minivan? No, actually, it wasn't the minivan. It was that little blue Nissan he had. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Used to tie the speakers to the back of their bed. <laughs> That's but uh yeah it was one of those things like you always remember where you were at when that happened yeah. and then after that it was just it was crazy because like you, you know everything after that was you know you couldn't fly anywhere you couldn't get on base you couldn't it, there was a lot of restrictions after that so it was kind of crazy so what was uh i guess what was the consensus with you and everybody else that was uh i guess serving around you was it kind of hyper focused on because immediately i know we we started uh wrapping things up for going into the middle east so i guess you guys kind of turned that up pretty quick huh well the thing was you didn't know if that was the only place they were going to attack you know you yeah. didn't know if, is my family safe back at home uh you know the pentagon had gotten hit you know the twin towers there's the one in Shanksville. Yeah, and then you know there was people saying that they were going to go to the White House. You know, so for us, I mean, well, for everybody, you didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. And uh, my biggest concern to this day now, you know, I had been I've gone to Iraq twice and I've went to Afghanistan once, and I just overseas when you see how they attack their population, you know, their 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 locals. Um, it's hard to, to defend against it. So I just saw how everything shut down. Aviation was down, you know what I'm saying? Um, the transportation, gases flew through the roof. You know, gas prices flew through the roof. Everything just, it got really bad for the American people for a while there. Because we weren't used to being a, getting attacked like this on our own, you know, on yeah. our own land. It happened somewhere else. It happened somewhere else all the time. So my biggest fear now is like, what if the way that they go about combat in other countries if they use those same kind of you know techniques here in america 
how would the American people be able to respond to that? Like the IEDs, you know, the VBIDs, the vehicle borne IEDs that they use, uh, just different things. I mean, American people aren't used to that. Yeah. And I think right now our country is divided really on Joe Biden, you know, and Trump and Democrats and Republicans. But I think the main concern here, Gabe, really is just it should be get united, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. when things go bad, it's us, you know. It, we got to find a way to make it where we're ready to defend ourselves. Because, um, you know, the soldier, the Marine, the airmen, uh, the Navy, you know, all those guys are out there. And they're trying to handle their business overseas to make sure it doesn't come over here. Because we know what it looks like. We know what war looks like. And yeah. it's not pretty, you know. I so. think that's one thing that... that we have a hard time understanding is we think we uh, civilians when mm-hmm. i say we right you know we think we understand you yeah. know and and it's 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 being naive right yeah. you see movies you see video games you think you see you know what's going on you right. know you hear about the stuff with the cartels and how they mm-hmm. what they do to people and until you're st- you're t- until you're standing five feet away from it you don't understand it right you know we talked about my buddy renee in, in the shootout that he had right you know i've got a bunch of guns i love to shoot mm-hmm. you know i tell everybody to shoot often mm-hmm. you know uh people got a real upset with the um the uh the uh what do they call it uh the carry texas just did the I've, concealed okay. yeah where you don't have to have the concealed right everybody's freaking out and you know i i tell people you know what i have my i have a concealed carry right uh but i would say the majority of people are say well say, i got my concealed carry i've got guns in the house right but the majority of people are not ready to defend their lives mm. you know they're not you know i tell my sister all the time you know it's it's easy to sit there and, and aim at a target take your time and squeeze and try and hit the bullseye right right but when your heart's beating and somebody's attacking you and you're fixing to die and you have to do something in a split second yeah. can you make that shot yeah can you make multiple shots what if you have multiple targets and that's the fight or flight they call you know yeah. are you going to fight when you, your adrenaline's pumping or are you going to fly you know i mean you're going to get run away from it so yeah it just depends on the individual and what they're ready to do i think a lot of what is a blessing to us is not just our servicemen and women but our veterans right. you know uh even even looking at what you see on the news and yeah. and it's crazy because you know it, people used to go wow well, I, I watch cnn <laughs> you know well you know the news isn't what the news used to be you you literally have to go to multiple sources and think for yourself on what you're being told to under, right. quite, really understand what's going on but you know when you think about you see all these veterans that are going to afghanistan to try and help get people out mm-hmm. you know and they're going via private money somebody's funding that you know but right now it's not the federal government Mm -hmm. but it's like these are veterans you know veterans like you that are going going over there to pull people out because they they know how important those relationships were that they built with afghani people or Mm -hmm. you know the people that they worked with or even just americans that are still left over there you know but like you like you touched on the cartels in the united states Mm -hmm. you know it's not with an open border on the south. Uh, I saw something the other day where Mexico says, send us as many Afghans as you want. We'll take them. <laughs> yeah. Of course you'll take them because right. you're going to end up in the United States in a little while. Yeah. You know, and when you get the extreme ones in here that start to, you know, come into communities and let it grow. But yet that, ideo- that ideology is still there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very scary. And we don't want that here. You know, and, and I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. You've seen it. I, I right. haven't. But uh we don't want that here yeah there's a there's a lot of things i think whenever you have situations like that uh there's a bigger picture that whoever's in charge of it in washington or wherever it's happening they don't want us to know about you know what i mean like we just see what like you said the news is showing six different channels are showing you different things um are they bringing these people in you know to have more votes at times depending on what kind of rights they get you know um whatever it might be but you're right the scary part is this person can be your neighbor and i'm not saying you know um stereotype people obviously it's just everybody deserves deserves a chance to that's my wife i love stereotyping (laughs) (laughs) i'm not gonna be a hypocrite i'm sure i'm guilty of it myself but um 
the scary part is you don't know these guys can get embedded you know into our communities like you said and become get a job at our schools you know or somewhere where they can gain access to you know our families and and, and things that we won't be able to just pick up right away and could cause danger to us you know yeah. i just i think that there's just we have to get smarter on the way we allow people to come into the united states absolutely um uh, and screen you know provide some kind of screening some kind of background checks so you know who's coming and you know what do they have a history you know criminal history uh, it's just there's a lot of things involved in you know and what we have to do to uh protect ourselves and our families because ultimately that's the, that's the main thing is you go to work every day to provide for your household um and you're expecting when you're expecting somebody else to do these things that you're talking yeah. about so you could be at work and not worried that somebody's going to come and attack your home or the grocery store and things like that yeah. the schools um when i was in afghanistan it was crazy to see how these kids gave used to walk along the side of a mountain miles just to get to some kind of education and then just hope to not run into some kind of taliban that was going to kidnap them that was going to kill them that was going to do whatever to them you know just that's just to go to school uh these we used to fly you know to certain places where I mean, isn't that isn't that friggin shocking and kind of a it should be a slap to the face to a lot of people when you think about a kid that's just trying to go to go to school right maybe get a meal mm -hmm. maybe learn to read and he's got to worry about getting taken and and put into the military or a child getting raped or right. or molested exactly. you know yeah. and <clears throat> we really we really kind of don't think about that kind of stuff. We're so disconnected from it. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a huge, vast amount of people in this country that they talk about globalism and they want to be one big global community. Right. But what about the trash in the globe? Oh, yeah. You know, these kinds of people that do that to, to kids. Right. You know, you, you know, on the border with using kids and putting them with families that aren't really theirs and they recycle them over and over and over. And it's like, right. I, 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 think there's, I think the squeaky wheel always gets the oil. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the squeaky wheel is fighting the easy fight. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to you wanna fight for kids, you want to fight for women's rights. There's some shitty places on this planet that you can go tr do that at. Yeah. You know, it's easy to say that here in the United States. It's mm -hmm. easy to, to carry that banner here. It's not easy in places like that or North Korea or even China. Right. You know, we're so content with buying, you know, cheap goods that we overlook what the things that China and North Korea do. Right. You know, it's, it's crazy. No, it is. And like, like we're talking about, you know, just kids that you're trying to, they're just excited to see some people that are being nice to them. Because we remember. Were they open to you guys? Were they receptive? They were. The kids were. The, uh, the older Afghan local national, the nationals used to live there that used to work with us. They had this thing where they didn't, the women weren't allowed to get close to us. Mm. They, if they got within like now 10 is, feet away from This isn't Taliban. This is just the culture. No, this is just the culture there. Okay. So if they got within close enough to us, they would throw rocks at them to get away from us. They had to keep, to keep their distance. Now the kids, they were allowed to come up to us. So a good friend of mine, actually he was my squad leader at the time, or at the time for Sergeant Cabin, Robert Cabin. Uh, he lives in Colorado now, so shout out to Rob. Uh, real good friend of mine, uh, him and his family. Love him to death. But uh, he and I deployed to Afghanistan together. And um, so we used to get chocolate, and I'm sure he remembers. And there was these kids that we got to give them some chocolate. And they had, gave, they had never even seen chocolate before. Mm. And you, I remember opening the wrapper up. And, um, Hang on, were you giving them milk chocolate or no, dark chocolate? Nobody it was wants some that dark expensive chocolate because chocolate okay. my buddy Rob was like, dude, don't give them that one. That one's like $8, <laughs> bro. Like, you know, what are you doing? Give, give them the, the dark other. chocolate. Yeah, give them the kisses chocolate, man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, so I remember opening up the wrapper and there was this little girl. And I'll never forget, her hands were so dirty. And she just, I mean, she looked like she'd been out outside for months on it and they slept in these tents you know these bedouins they call them um that are out in the middle of nowhere you know the first time they saw us land in a helicopter to them it was like what is this like what kind of machine is this? it may as well be a spaceship yeah right? they were just amazed by what it was and um so yeah we opened up the the candy bars and, and gave it to them and just to see the expression on their face and 
it, it was just crazy and it hit me kind of hard too because the little girl reminded me of my daughter you know Micaiah and uh being gone I didn't come home uh I was actually going to get out of the service uh that was back in 2004 when I went to Afghanistan it was my first deployment and um I had already discussed you know my wife then I told her I was going to get out I was like maybe we should get out because Micaiah was she was I think she was like six, seven months old. Oh, she's a little baby. She was a baby. And uh, I told her, you know what? I'm just going to go to Afghanistan. It's a 12-month deployment. And uh, I'm not going to come home. I was like, I'm going to stay there for the whole year. I'll save my leave. And then I'll let it build up. And when I come back, I can get out of the Army a lot sooner. So she was kind of, not, she was kind of against it. You know, she's like, you're going to go for a long time and not come home. So um, that's what I did. But when I was downrange, I ended up deciding that i was going to re-enlist mm. i said i'm gonna go ahead and stay and i talked to her and i was like hey you know maybe it's a good idea for us to stay because there was this helicopter company in oklahoma that i was going to try to work for do maintenance on it and i had talked to them and they couldn't guarantee it they couldn't guarantee to hold a spot for me because they said you're in a combat zone anything can happen there like, we hope it doesn't but right we can't hold a position like that you know just for you to get back and so at that time i just made the choice you know to stay there so um, and re-enlist. I stayed the whole 12 months gone and then uh, decided that I was just going to stay in and, and try to go from there. And that's what that little, you know, that little girl reminded me a lot about my daughter because um, she, it was just tough to see kids like that, that you know that they're not going to have a real opportunity to do anything. You know, they're not going to have the opportunity that, that we have over here in America, you know. And it's sad. It's really a sad. So. so how long were you... Uh how long were you in Afghanistan in total? Just the 12 months? Or did you I left after that? I, I left in April of 2004, and I got home in April of 2005. So I was there the whole okay. 12 months. Okay. But after being there for so long, uh, some of my command was like, hey, they, they do this thing where it's an R&R. &R. They're like, hey, uh, this place is getting to you. It's time for you to go somewhere. So they sent me to Qatar. They sent me to Qatar for four days. And um, I went there. It was kind of a good little getaway. But, you know. It was time to go back after the four days, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to get this deployment over with. And it was, out of my three deployments, that was probably one of the best ones. I I would say one of the most uh, toughest. Uh, I ended up losing one of my, my real good friends there, Daniel Ga uh, Gavin. In Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, in a helicopter crash. Um, and he was my squad leader in Hawaii. And, um, yeah, he he ended up getting... Uh, we, I lost him over there and uh, in Afghanistan. So it was a real tough deployment. We did some, some you know, crazy things over there that uh, had to be done, you know. And and, sure. to, and it's just one of those things where it's just uh, after being gone for twelve months, I was like, hey, I'll never do this again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna come home early next time. So well, you know, it's it's crazy because I'm preaching to the choir, so. You can set me straight anytime you want. But to me, when I think about something like that, it's almost like you're trained to be plugged in, right? Right. <clears throat> and I would imagine that getting unplugged is very difficult. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because if, if, you're, if you're not sharp, you get hurt or people die. Right. So to, to unplug and go to Qatar... You know, maybe that's helpful, but you're truly not unplugged because you're still over there. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, I would imagine that's something that, you know, you train. I would imagine in the military you train for certain things, and then when it's in wartime, you train for certain things. Right. And I don't know that you're helped or trained to unplug and come back, I mean, and, and be a civilian again. Right. You know what I'm saying? And see, there's a lot of movies out there, Gabe, that kind of hit on that. And there's, you know, Hollywood puts their twist on a bunch of movies. Sure. And there's some movies out there that people have asked me, somebody's been like, hey, does this movie kind of, is this for real? Like, is this, is it like this or is it like that? And um, Hurt Locker, I don't know if you've watched Hurt Locker. It was a long time ago. Okay. Well, there's a part in that movie where he's deployed, he's overseas, right? He's downrange and he's he's back home like the next day or two days from then and he's in the grocery store with his wife and his kid and she's like okay you go get the milk or the cereal and i'll go get the milk 
right? So he walks and he gets into the aisle and there's cereal everywhere. And like you said, the, the civilians might not get that, the point that they're trying to make in that movie. The point is exactly what you just said right now. One day he's overseas. He's disarming, you know, bombs on the road, IEDs and stuff. Seeing as people get blown up and things. And then the next day he's picking out what kind of cereal he's going to have with his family. And you're correct. There is no way to disconnect that. There is no way to. It's not like a, a switch, you know. You can't just turn it on and off. Once you see it, once you've been there, there's no shutting it off. Your mind will take it and it will absorb it. And it will store it. And it's there. And it will come back. You know, that's where you get these triggers and people post, you know, PTSD. Um, it happens like that because when I was in, you would deploy and you could have what they call boots on the ground six months, Gabe. And those guys were right back in Iraq or Afghanistan. So I went to Afghanistan and came back home and then ended up coming. I was in Hawaii and then I ended up getting stationed here in Fort Hood here in Texas and not even a year to the date I was already in Iraq but when I was in Iraq uh I was on my way home I was on my way home to come see my family wife and kids and uh, I had met up with somebody in Kuwait because you transitioned and uh he had just he had whispered to me he's like hey there's a, there's a rumor going on that we're going to get extended well we're already doing a 12-month deployment so He's like, there's a rumor that we're going to get de uh, deployed or extended 15 months. So I ended up coming home. So an additional 15 months or well, up no, to a 15? total of 15 okay. months. And uh, so I came home, spent time with the family. And by that time, I had already had my three youngest and I already obviously had my oldest daughter, Kendra. And uh, but uh, I already had my son, Benny Jr. And then uh, Eli was a baby. And uh, so. I came home and then went back, and man, by that time I had already heard, "Hey, we're gonna get you know extended. We're gonna be a total of 15 months." Well, here you are telling your family, "Hey, I'll be home in three months," because I came, I had came home at nine months, so mm -hmm. I thought I was going back for just three months and I was coming back home, but it wasn't the case. Come to find out, so hey, you got to make that call home and you know tell them you're gonna be here longer. So it was just it, it it's tough because you go to that deployment, you come back. And then, not even a year later, I was right back in Iraq. So it was just, you take, all, they say that for one deployment, it takes three years for a serviceman or woman to get over, or, you know, not get over, but get help and try to acclimate to normal acclimate life. To normal life. And, and then the things you saw and the things you did and the things you missed, you know what I mean? So you got to imagine some people weren't even getting, you know, eight, you know, six months at home. And they were already back in country. So, yeah, there's no way of shutting it off like you were talking about. It. You, I mean, you said it exactly right. Like, there is no way for people to to shut it off. So, uh, I'm sure everybody's got different ways of, of doing things and handling things <clears throat> differently. Right. <sighs> when you finally... It, and it's crazy because when, when you're in country, mm -hmm. like you say, you're downrange, you're a different Benny. Right. You know, but when you come home... And you've got three kids at home and a wife. Four kids. Four kids, yeah. you know, and, and a wife. And you're just kind of, it's it's crazy to think of of the mental struggle that has to happen there. You know, to, to be able to, because you wish it was a switch. Because that, that's how that's how your your time is being treated. Right. It's, hey, you're on, you're off. You're on, you're off. Yeah, exactly. So what kinds of things do you think benefited you to try and get acclimated to being home you know what were there did you have times where you struggled with it or did you which i'm sure you did right but what did you do to try and help that or was there nothing and was it just fighting and arguing you know i mean it there was a, a time after my second deployment which was my 15 month deployment because i ended up i deployed from Hawaii I went to Afghanistan I was with the 25th and then I came back to Hawaii then I came to Fort Hood and I deployed to Iraq twice you know and then when I deployed twice to Iraq from Fort Hood I got orders to go right back to Hawaii so I was in Hawaii the second time 
So by that time, my wife had already noticed that I wasn't the same Benny like you're talking about because it couldn't shut that switch off. So you imagine somebody three deployments and then coming home, the stress is different. You know, now you're, it's a different world. You have two different worlds, right? The one that you are exposed to and you're always on alert. You're always having to watch your back. You have to watch your buddy's back. Uh, you're out on mission, flying around. Um, and those long hours, 16, 17 hour days and no sleep. There was times I would wake up and I, w I thought I was at home. You know, Some, I, would, I would call for my kids or, you know, I'd call for Erica. I'd be like, and I'd notice, I'd be like, damn, I'm still in Afghanistan or I'm still in Iraq. And it was just ongoing. It was a daily thing. So when I got home, I had gotten to a point where I had gotten real cold. You don't know what it's like until you've been there. You know what I'm saying? So when you get home, you don't trust anybody. You, 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 uh, and this not might not be for everybody, but that's how it was for me. Um, you just got to a point where everything was aggravating. Um, you didn't really want to be around people. Um, there was times for even your kids. Like you just, you felt a different way. You you didn't know how to allow them to care for you, love you, or just make you laugh. You know, they just, it was a different person. I was a different person. So I got to the point where. My wife was like, hey, man, you probably need to go see somebody. You probably need to get some help. And um, I was like, no, you know, I'm fine. You know, the denial is where a lot of veterans, you know, they make that mistake, Gabe, where they don't think anything's wrong with them. They can't see it, but the people around you notice it. It's just like if you lose weight, you're working out, you're working out, you're working out. And Somebody sees you every day. Well, they can't see the results or even yourself. You're looking at yourself in the mirror. And you're like, no, I'm not losing weight. I'm not losing weight. But you have somebody that hasn't seen you in about seven months. And they're like, man, you look good. You know, it's something similar to that. You don't see the change in you, but other people around you do. They're like, this isn't the same Benny or, you know, he doesn't laugh at the same jokes. You know, he doesn't react the same way he did. Or So luckily, I ended up, you know. Uh, going and seeing somebody and talking to him. And uh, this doctor, I'm going to put his name out there, Michael Kamek, uh, is a person. He was a Marine veteran. Uh, and he had been in Vietnam. And when he got out, he decided he wanted to go and join the Army. So then he joined the Army. And then he, he got out. He retired. And uh, he ended up saving my life, I'm telling you. And where were you when you met him? I was in Hawaii. Okay. That was my last deployment or I had gotten done with my last deployment and talking to him and, and, um, seeing how the things he went through in Vietnam, they went through some horrible stuff. You know, people already know what histories, you sure. know, those guys didn't get welcome home the way we did from Iraq or Afghanistan. They didn't have buses of people, you know, waiting for you at the parade field and you know flags all over the road these guys came I, to I think people. we welcome our veterans now because of the way they were treated exactly these guys would get off at the airport with nobody to welcome them you know home and getting their uniform spit on after being gone and seeing their buddies get killed you know or you know them getting shot things like that and he just was able to take me and and put things in perspective for me like the things that were important that i you know that i thought at that time just didn't matter anymore you know so um he he was able to to make me see things a different way and 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 really i owe him you know and i say this to anybody i owe him my life you know but had erica not told me to go and get help you know uh i don't think we'd be having this conversation you know because yeah. uh a lot of veterans, uh, when they go through things, they see things, and, and they don't know how to cope. They don't know how to 
open up to people. I'd, I'd imagine also it's a hard, it's got to be difficult to experience the things y'all have experienced and to see the things that you guys see right. and to even start a conversation. Right. You know, how do you even, like, you describing this guy and, and his ex-military background and where he comes from makes sense to why he would be so good at what he does. Right. But it's like, outside of having somebody like that available to you, mm -hmm. you know, and let's say you're going to go talk to a private psychologist, you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're you using your, you know, Valero insurance. And yeah. how do you, you know, and I'm not asking you to tell me how it, but it's like, it's a question for just for the air. You know, how do you even start that conversation of things that you've done and things that you've seen? You know, so it's got to be difficult, you know. So so for for a guy that's, I would imagine, that's seen stuff like that and experienced those experiences, it's easier to suppress it than it is to start a conversation yeah exactly you know? well i remember the first times like, i went in there and tried to talk to him kind of remind me of goodwill hunting remember we met him mm -hmm. we didn't want to talk to uh um what's his name robin williams robin williams right and he found ways and techniques to get him to open up the well, same way this you know he uh, dr cam used to keep the room real cold right and i i wasn't gonna know i wasn't gonna tell him anything i had to tell, i'm not talking to this guy well i didn't know anything about him so I'd go in there, and in Hawaii, you're wearing shorts and a short sleeve shirt and sandals or whatever. So I'm sitting there, and I'm freezing gay. Well, he was doing it for a reason. He's like, this guy's not going to open up to him to me. I'm going to get him to open up. So uh, it was cold. He, he had to have that AC like on 50, I'm telling you. And I was trying to hold off as long as I could until finally I'm like, it's kind of cold in here. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> you want me to turn it, you know, turn it up? I was like, yeah. I was like, I'm not used to cold like that. He's like, well, where are you from? I was like, I'm from Texas. Oh, yeah? And he's like, oh, I'm from Arizona. We're in Texas. And after he started that, like, he, he got into it right there. He he found a way to get me to open up. And, I mean, he we just, he became a real good friend of mine. And, um, but, yeah, like I said, he found ways. You know, he had techniques. And I wasn't the only veteran he talked to, you know. But I'm sure he he saved a lot of other people's lives because just by the way he was his mannerisms and his knowledge and how uh how much experience he had and the things we had seen and the things we had done that um he was able to apply those and, and and help us out do you still find yourself needing that conversation or or that kind of therapy today or every day every day do you get it or what do you do for it there is a there there are triggers that I spoke about earlier, where you could be, you've probably heard people say slamming doors or, you know, uh, anything like that. I've got some friends that have a hard time with, like, fireworks and things like that. The fireworks really don't scare me so much because my birthday's on the 4th of July, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah, so you've been used I to gotta it. I got to celebrate, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's some Corona, it's Bud Light or something, Michelob. Yeah. But, uh, no, there's certain things that I, that I, that happened to me or that I saw that when... I came home, if I was able to, uh, if I saw myself in that kind of situation where I saw, um, like, I'll tell you one is for me to put my hand in the freezer, you know, anytime I put my hand in the freezer, it gives me a trigger. It makes me think of something. And what he would, there was ways for you to, how can I say, um, a breathing techniques, you know, for veterans that are out there listening to this. You know, your breathing techniques um, and just clear your mind. Um, just know that the trigger is just temporary. It's just there. It's going to go away. Um, and there, there's a lot of times where if you're a veteran and you got PTSD and it's a real thing. Sure. It, 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 it is a real thing to have PTSD. for, And if you don't see it and you don't recognize it, those triggers are going to continue. You're going to get them more often, and um, what's it called? It's gonna it's gonna have its effect on you. You know. So yeah. would would you would you kind of, for lack of better phrasing, would, would you kind of consider it as almost doing daily daily maintenance? You know, keeping your oh, house yeah. clean. Yeah. You know? I have this app on my app, my Apple Watch. It's a breathing technique, mm. and you it comes on like every four or five hours. 
And I'll tell you, it's time to take a minute breath. You take, you know, deep breath in, you know, and ex- inhale, exhale, you know. And that breathing helps you. It clears your mind, it clears the stress. And uh, that's, so there's just, that's just one technique, you know, of things that you can do to, to clear your mind when you have a thought that comes to your head or, you know, a reminder of a buddy you lost or um, just things like that. So, uh, uh, you know, just in talking to you about this, and we've known each other a long time, and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, we ha- we've never talked about any of this kind of stuff, but just in talking to you, yeah. it looks like you've got a fairly decent handle on on your PTSD. Right. And is what... <clears throat> Was it the fact that you doing these these breathing techniques and other things that you've learned to kind of deal with it? When did you buy into it 100 percent? You know, was, was it seeing the results working or is he, are you still just Benny from back in high school? Where you <laughs> bought when you bought back then when you bought into something, you bought into it 100 yeah. percent. You know, is it something similar to that or is it something where this is actually you're seeing the results working? And so now you're committed to doing those acts. Um, I think for me, it was one of those things where we talked like earlier, I, I didn't see the change. But when my family started seeing the change in me, where they could see like, OK, like I'll give you a good example was before I left. I remember I couldn't I could my boy would come up and hug me. He was my first son. You know, what I mean, he's like I, mean, I could just feel his warmth him hugging me and it felt good. You know, have him put his little arms around my neck, you know, and coming back like to me i didn't feel that you know i I just i just there was no like i'm not gonna say a meaning but it just it didn't i didn't feel that warmth from my son you know i didn't feel it was just different the feelings were cold and um seeing the change once i started going to the doctors and seeing and talking to people you could see them now being happier which in return made me happy because it's like if they saw a change in me then whatever I was doing was working, you know? So it was like, all right, now you're taught, you know, left or right, keep marching, go forward, keep going, don't look back, you know? And as I kept going forward, they got happier. And as they got happier, I got happier. And they just, that's when I bought into it, when I knew that, okay, they got my back, you know what I'm saying? They're my little, you know, squad now. This, These are the people that, are going to be here for me when I'm at my darkest, you know? Like when they say when the demons come, these are the people right here. I used to tell my wife at times, like, hey, stay up with me. Two, three o'clock in the morning game. I couldn't sleep, you know? I had a German Shepherd at the time. I'd bring my German Shepherd in the room. I'd put my kids, and they would all be in the same room. And I'd lay by the door and leave the light in the hallway on so I could see if there was any shadows going on, you know? Things like that. They were the ones there watching me go through those things they were the ones you know having to put up with me so when i saw them when i saw the expressions in their face and i saw them they they were proud of me because i finally took the advice and i went and talked to somebody so for them to wait for me and sit around and like you know take the time to be patient with me told me a you got to buy into this because this is working. So, I know that these kinds of things, the, the timeline is different for everybody, but from you getting out to getting to the point where you, you, you bought in 100%, your kids are getting better with it, you're getting better with it, how much time had passed? Um, <coughs> probably about a year and a half to two years. Uh, but there was other things that, kind of knocked me off the tracks you know um i hadn't seen my dad and my mom in a long time and when i got home i had finally retired i came home my dad was real sick you know my dad i mean i got home and dad was probably three days away from passing mm. he hadn't been to the doctor or nothing and he was having his kidney failure and so i got home and and took him to to the doc and and just was there for him you know help him you know and and trying to get him better yeah and uh so anyways i had him for about another year he lived for about another year and he was my rock you know what i'm saying he was my grandparents as you know we've known each other for a long time uh when i was three months old 
uh, my grandma and my grandpa took me in. And, uh, man, they were already, my dad was probably in his 50s. And my mom was in her late 40s. Yeah. And they took me in. And, I mean, we didn't have much. We grew up poor, you know, the last road in the bottom, you know yeah, what I'm saying? The back side, The yeah. back side right there. <laughs> you couldn't go no more because it'd be the woods. You know, yeah. you'd be living in the woods. But uh, we grew up poor, you know what I'm saying? And um, But we never went hungry, you know what I'm saying? We always had clothes. We had a roof over our head. And there was a lot of love, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Uh, it was old school love. You know, they're going to tear your butt up, you sure. know, if you acted up. You know what I'm saying? It was that corporal punishment. Uh, you were going to do right. You were going to act right. You are going to respect people. But... Uh, losing my dad that right there i thought I, I had seen a lot of things Gabe. i was like man there is no way no way nothing can knock me down nothing i've seen it all and uh losing my dad showed me that yeah you you're not as strong as you think you are so you lose a parent you know what i'm saying so you lose somebody that close to you um it it took a lot for me to not, um, how can I say? Revert, maybe? Revert, yeah. I, it took all the strength in my body when I lost my dad uh, to uh, to not revert, yeah. It was tough. It was tough. Um, and he was just somebody that, you know, I needed advice or things like that. You know, like you need other dad or, sure. or mom. Uh, when I lost him, you know, it was just a big part of my of my heart that was gone. So it was tough. Yeah, there, I, I tell people there's times in certain things that happen in our lives where uh, I call them. I call them personally. I call them uh, "you ain't shit" moments. Yeah, you know, and it's a, it's things that happen where you go, I, "I'm not who I thought I was." Right. You know, and and this just kind of put me in a place that I I wasn't expecting to be. You know, it, it, so were there, after your dad had passed, was it going back to the things that you'd learned that helped you move through that? Or, or well, it, it didn't finish. It didn't end there. Yeah. Uh, my family had never lost somebody within the immediate family like that. Well, after my dad died in 2014, not even, well, I might get the timelines wrong, but, uh, my aunt ended up passing real close aunt of mine i mean she was she was uh, the closest of one of my aunts that i had and um my dad passed she passed and then i had an uncle pass and then uh one of my my cousins ended up passing and then i had another aunt pass all within a year jeez you know so our family had never lost anybody until my dad was the first one, then it just started happening. And I had just gotten home, so it was like, man, like, what's going on? I just saw all this go on, being deployed. You know, I wasn't expecting to come home to this, you know? Yeah. And it was like, I went from one to the other. And it's like, here we go. But uh, I, I think that God has a crazy way of setting you up when you lose your faith. Because I grew up in a, in a household like you did. You know, where we go to the Pentecostal church and you sit there and you get up and you clap your hands and you dance and everybody got tambourines and everybody's, you know what I mean? And then, Wait, I was Catholic, so we did 45 okay. minutes. You did six hours, man. Yeah. They, they, they took you hostage in the Pentecostal we had church. To, we know? had to take my grandma lunch and dinner. Yeah. So it was one of those things where my mom was like, hey, you're going to go. But see, it was kind of a thing where my mom was like, you're going to be Pentecostal, right? You're going to go to this church. You're going to go to these Bible schools, Bible studies and stuff. But then you're going to be Catholic, too. So I had to be both. So I told mom, I was like, mom, why am I going to church over here and church over there? She was like, because you need it, son. So do you feel <laughs> Do you feel that you were getting, you were distancing yourself from God as far as, you know, the religious aspect of it? Yeah. Um, well, as you and I know, uh, we were introduced, Gabe, you and I, and a bunch of our buddies to death at a very young age yeah. in high school. And I'm not going to mention no names for the respect of families and stuff out there, but we lost some very close buddies you know four friends and um you and i and everybody else that was involved as far as like that was affected by it we were introduced to death at a very young age yeah and a lot of that stuff i'm not gonna lie to you i questioned like why why did this happen like and there was no answer well who's gonna be able to answer something like that so as i grew up or got older 
and went through high school and started becoming a knucklehead and you know my dad had that talk with me like what are you gonna do you know i had my my oldest daughter was already born you know and i decided to join the service well i thought getting away was gonna get me away from the, you know from the pain and the hurt that we had gone through from losing our friends it and was it was everywhere man for a long time it in was this town. it was and um so i made the choice to join the service and like I said, you know, you see it there and then you come back home and you you do lose your, your faith. You do you lose your, how can I say, um, your trust in God, you know. And what my mom used to always tell me, son, like, you know, who did I pray to to bring you home? You know what I'm saying? Like, you didn't just go to these three wars and come back because, you know, nobody's somebody's not watching over you you know it's like somebody's watching over you. somebody was there with you you know that, that's a that's her saying that that's huge man yeah that that's a that woke me up yeah she uh so when i got home my mom used to say son you need to go to church then so i was like mom i'm all churched out mom you, you sent me to two different churches when i was young <laughs> And she's like, no, you need to get back. You need to get your kids. You need to get them baptized. You need, to, you know, confirmations, all these things. And I was like, no, nah, I'll find my way. I'll find my way. Well, I had lost my faith, man. That's what it was. The things I, and the things I had seen and things, you know, that I had done and things that I didn't at the time know I, they were going on, you know, that I had to do. So I had to find my way back. You know, I had to find my way back and. I'm glad I did, you know, so, yeah. and I, I, I've, I've gone through some, some major, uh, bumps on the road here lately, uh, but once again, I had to find a way to get up and just, like I said, just keep go going forward and just keep my faith and just say, hey, man, like, people fall down all the time, you know, like, you just have to find a way to get up and and just keep marching man you know and that, that's one thing that i think we <clears throat> you know you i don't know you, you tr your parents always try and uh teach you things and right. explain things to you so that you don't have because they're trying to teach you s some of the things that they learned right right and and they know you're gonna have your own experiences but if they can save you from three of them yeah because they've already done them mm -hmm. you know but we don't learn that way you know and I think one thing that we we start to see as we get older, and it's going to happen to, it happened to our parents, and it happened to their parents. It's going to happen to your kids and your right. grandkids because they're all going to go through the same thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you, you start to realize how difficult life can be. Right. You know, it's it's, and I think that's where a lot of people get lost in whether they have PTSD or whether. You know, it, maybe they've never served and they just, they have issues with wanting to even exist anymore. Right. You know, and life is extremely difficult, but mm -hmm. the the parts that are good about life mm -hmm. outweigh the extremely difficult parts. Right. You know, and it's, I, I talked to mom last weekend, we had a conversation, we did a couple of podcasts with her and, you know... It's like I told her, as I get older, I start to understand things a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. And we 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 tend to forget in the middle of living our lives that the things that are happening, this conversation, for example, mm -hmm. you know, I try and do a better job of enjoying the moment. Right. You know, I'm just as guilty as a lot of people. I'm constantly, okay, when I get done talking with Benny, I got an X, Y, and Z. And blah, blah. You uh -huh. know what I'm saying? Right. Everybody does it. I'm no, I'm guilty of it too. But I, it's important that we start to say, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now, and that's all I'm concerned with. Right. I'm going to enjoy this moment. And in 20 years from now, you know, when we're listening to this again, I can go, man, that was a great <laughs> time. Yeah. You know, I look back on so many things and... and and I, I, you know, I, it's you're constantly trying to move forward. Right. You're constantly trying to get to something else or find something better or find someone better or a different job. Mm -hmm. And it's like 
we're not enjoying where we're at right now. Right. You know, and I think when we can learn to enjoy where we're at right now, it really starts to put life in perspective. You know? Right. Uh, whether it's purchasing things or buying things, it's like, we, you know, it's difficult for us. And there's times where you're in a situation or a relationship or a job that that's not right for you. Right. And that's that's okay, too. Figure that out and get, get the hell out of there. Right. You know, but at the same time, when we're in something that we're just like, Eh, I've been I've been doing this job for a long time, but but you know what? But it's a good job. Yeah, you know it pays your bills and it keeps your stress level low. You know that's when, now that we're in our forties. You know we work with a, I work with a bunch of guys and, and a lot of them are younger, right? Right. And uh, you know I, I, this sounds terrible, but sometimes I'm like, let the younger guys go do it. <laughs> you know I'm 44 now. Yeah. You know yeah I still enjoy my job. I still like what I do, but. I'm not 25 years old, right? You know, let that somebody go get it. Go get let it. Let somebody else go get it. You know what <laughs> yeah. I'm saying? But you know, I, one thing, one thing that I, you know, wanted to talk to you about, and, and I, you brought it up as well, is especially with the with the veterans and the military mm-hmm. folks, being able to seek help when they need it, right? You know, and it sounds like you got it when you were in Hawaii, mm-hmm. and you got it again when you were talking to your mom. Right. And, and you got it again, you know, when your your family was, when you were more receptive to your family, because it sounds like your family was always receptive to you. Right. You just had a hard time letting them in. Mm-hmm. And when you were capable of doing that, things really started changing and, and changing to the point where it was more visible to you, mm-hmm. you know, which it may have always been visible to them. They always loved their, their dad. Right. You know, they always wanted to hug you. Mm-hmm. You know, the the warm hug they gave you that you didn't feel at times, they felt it. Right. It was just a matter of time of you getting to where you could feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, so being able to have lived through those experiences, what do you want to share with people that either won't allow themselves to get there? Or are struggling to get there. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, there's VA hospitals everywhere, right? So Corpus has two of them that I know of. The one old, old Brownsville Road, the one that I've been to several times. Um, and there's the Valley has a bunch of them. If you suffer from a TBI, traumatic brain injury, the one in Harlington is real good at that, you know. PTSD, they got the, the hotlines you can call on the phone. Uh, there's so many different things out there, so many different programs and different uh, people you can talk to. And now with social media, I mean, look what we're doing now, you and I. Sure. How easy is it to, you can have a phone, you can open up YouTube. There's so many things available for people now that there's not really not an excuse to uh, not get help. The thing is, is, a lot of people, including myself, when you, it's that you don't, people don't want to talk about it, game. People don't want to admit it. People don't want somebody else to know, hey, you know, because it's just not veterans. You know, you got, you got um, EMT responders, game that see accidents on the road every day. Firefighters that are knocking down doors, you know, with axes and they have to go in and see people that are in those homes. You know, in a big major, you know, in a major fire. I mean, these guys get PTSD from that all the time. You know what I'm saying? So it's just not the the veteran that suffers from PTSD. You got all these first responders, you know, these nurses, you know, that that are out there, even with like this COVID now that's going on. You don't think these people invest all their time into these people and then just to see them pass away. Sure. You don't think they suffer from something like that? That's PTSD in a different form. Nursing home nurses as well. Nursing, yeah. you know, the, the nursing home, the, the hospice nurses. Uh, PTSD exists, but if you don't see it, if you don't want to admit to it, or if you don't want to get the help, um, then with time, it, and I was told before, they said, Benny, just because you don't see it today, right? Just because it didn't hit you today doesn't mean 15 years from now you're not going to be sitting somewhere and it's all going to come crumbling down it's going to hit you like a mac truck that's scary yes so my doc told me 
you are free to go now if you want, right? And just roll the dice that it's going to hit you today, in a year, in five years, in 20 years. He said, what are you willing to lose along the way? Is it worth it? Or you're here now. What is it going to cost you? He said, the decision is yours. So he's right. You know what I mean? Like, if the help's available, take it now. Why chance everything, losing everything, to see what's going to happen on the back end? To me, it just wasn't worth it. What do they say, 2022 veterans? 22 veterans uh, commit suicide. Every day? Well, to me, it's just, are the numbers... um, have they have the numbers gone up or have the numbers go down? Like how many people reported it? You know what I mean? Like you don't know how many, you know, are, how can I say, how many reported are not reported, I'm sorry, that were suicides and we're thinking it's 22. I'm thinking it's a lot more. But I, I think there was this thing going around the push-up challenge. You saw it on Facebook all the yeah. time. People yeah. would challenge you like, hey, Gabe, do 22 push-ups. You know what I mean? And it's it's a way for people to interact with veterans. Um, to me, I had thought about how can I make a difference and make a change in trying to help somebody out. So I had thought about on your days off, go somewhere and find a veteran, right? And kind of similar to what you're doing. So if this idea gets out there and somebody does it, more power to them, you know what I'm saying? Because that means something good will come out of this. But find a veteran, take him out to eat. It doesn't have to be nothing expensive. The mall, wherever you see him, and sit down with him. Pick his brain. Talk to him. Shake his hand. Give him a hug. So Vietnam veterans, you know what I'm saying? And just talk to him. That person could be at the end of his string. And just that day, by you going and talking to him and buying him a lunch or breakfast or dinner or whatever that might change his day that might make him say like do somebody does care you know and it will it will make a difference i'm telling you so i had thought about how can i go out there and how can i make this work Uh, and just let people know hey there's help out there find a way that while you're eating and talking be like hey there's help it worked for me I'm a veteran just like you. And look, it can change your life. I'd love to see something. I think that's a great idea. I'd love to see communities make more of an effort to come together and hold something. Right. Maybe monthly, you know. And like you said, open to veterans, EMTs, police officers. Mm -hmm. You know, something in the park hot dogs or something you know the community get together and do something like that i think and and i know that they still exist but one thing as i've gotten gotten older and kind of look back is it bums me out to see vfws go away all oh, right yeah because vfws when we were kids yeah was full of old grumpy military guys exactly yeah. they hated when we go in there yeah, you know, we go drink all their beer. We and shoot and shoot pool <laughs> and with, shoot he, with pool. Gilbert Hive. That's right. And and you know, in hindsight, they veterans need that. Yeah, they need a place to go and be with other veterans because there's guys that and women that aren't gonna want to go sit with a doctor in a doctor's office. Right. But if they go and they sit, you know, at a table and maybe have a beer or two with. With people that have been through similar things that they've they've had to go through, right? And maybe they can have a conversation and go home at the end of the day, and you know what? They didn't, they didn't have the shitty day they expected to have, right? You know, uh, it's it's uh, to me that those were more important than what I realized that they were when I was younger. Yeah, you know, and I would love to see communities put more effort into that because, like you said, you come home and you're expected to. Plug back in the to Live Oak County. Yeah, family man. And it's like, but that's not who I was for a long time. Yeah, you know, uh, I think I think when people talk about community and doing things, that's a great place to invest. Yeah, and I like and 
the fact that you you even mentioned people that maybe weren't in the military that are serving in other ways that see things. You know, I've got a buddy that's a firefighter. And yeah. He's talked about pulling people out of cars that were flooded in, in rivers. Exactly. And, and uh, it's traumatic, man. It's tough on people. And, yeah. you know, when people see that over and over and they feel like nobody cares and they yeah. feel like Appreciate it. it's just a heavy weight, yeah. you know. And there, there's a sense of hopelessness that starts to set in on people. And if there isn't an outlet for them to disrupt that hopelessness, mm. that's when they turn to, to suicide. Right. You know, that's when they turn to, <clears throat> to drugs and alcohol or, or violence or crime or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. there, there's people like, like we talked about earlier. It's, it's a tough subject. Yeah. It's tough to, to go, you know, hey, here it is all on the table. Everything out of my pockets. Now you know what I got. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to expose themselves to that when they've seen things that, you know, you guys have seen. Yeah. Experiences you guys have had. But it's important to happen because if you don't disrupt that hopelessness, it's 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 not a good outcome, man. Yeah, it's not. And see, um, unfortunately for one of my buddies, I'm not gonna say his name either, uh, just out of respect for his family as well. But um, I was already in Hawaii, and uh, he was dealing with some things, and um, he didn't get the help that he needed, and. Um, I had talked to him, I won't lie to you, it was probably a couple of months prior to uh, to him, you know, committing suicide. Uh, they, I, I didn't catch on, and, and I should have. Maybe I should have asked more questions, and maybe I should have. Uh, so you were able to have a conversation that didn't even yeah, show signs. Exactly. And maybe he was trying to talk to me about it, and I just I wasn't picking up on him. And he was going through some stuff. And he got to the point where he just felt like he didn't have an out, like you're talking about. Maybe he didn't talk to the people that could have gave him that help or that buddy that could have been like, hey, man, look, you know, things will get better. Like you said, if you're in a bad relationship, get out of it, you know. Just somebody there that could have maybe just drank a beer with them and been like, hey, man, like everything's be okay. I'm right here, dude. I'll lay in traffic for you if you lay in traffic for me. You know what I'm saying? We got each other's back. Uh, he didn't have that and I ended up getting a call that he had gotten to a point where he just couldn't handle it anymore and he ended up committing suicide and it was tough it, 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 it was tough because had I of maybe asked more questions or maybe called him more um, could I have helped prevent that? Um, and I have another buddy here just recently. Just He just retired. And he's having a difficult time. But you know what, Gabe? First thing I did, I messaged him and I was like, hey, give me a call. I don't care if it's 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning. Give me a call. And he did. And I feel bad because he did call at 3 in the morning. I didn't answer. But you know what? <laughs> I called him at 7 in the morning. But... And he, you know, he was finding a way to filter his, his stuff. I mean, and, and I congratulate him because, I mean, he was out there and he found a way to filter his thoughts and, and the way he felt. And um, I, I hope he keeps calling me, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep calling him and I'm going to stay and I'm going to stay engaged in, 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 in calling and, and trying to be there for him because I think more veterans need to do that for each other and, 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 um, provide that that communication between each other so that we can keep things like suicide from happening because not everybody can find a way to 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 deal with it the way they need to you know i I think one thing that's important for people to try and remember is everybody has strong times and weak times right and Mm -hmm. neither one of them lasts forever right you know and when you're in a weak moment you need to ask for help you, you know, even if it's just calling somebody to have a conversation to distract you from what you're feeling. Right. And when you're strong, you need to be available to people mm-hmm. so that you can help. Right. You know, and it, it really is something that I think a lot of people need to be more more aware of, more conscious of, 
you know, I think with, like we talked about earlier, you know, we have a country that's real divided right now. Right. And it's like if you, if you can just detach yourself from what you're plugged into at the moment right now. We mm-hmm. use plugged in again. Right. But if you can kind of t- unplug yourself from this political stuff and start looking at the things around you and the people around you, you'll see things more clearly and you see that you have more co- in common with people that you don't think that you do. And right. you'll be able to see when somebody's struggling or when somebody's needing something. And I think that'll happen for people as well, too. You know, one mm-hmm. thing that I try and do a decent job of, and I've, as I've gotten older, I've gotten worse at it, but it's just touching base with people. You know, hey, you guys doing all right? What are you up to? And I, you know, uh, a lot of times it's it's uh, just needing a distraction. A lot of times it's me needing a distraction. Right. You know, I'm asking you what you're doing because I need somebody to talk to. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm not in as dire straits as some people might be in, but you know what? I'm bored out of my mind, and I'm not doing anything, and... I need some distracting. Right. You know, and that's okay. And it's important to to be open to people reaching out to you, you know, when maybe if it's two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, you know, if you're awake, answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. You know. And I'm just as guilty as that. I mean, I'm number eleven out of sixteen kids. Yeah. You know, eight boys, eight girls. And you would think I would have better communication with my own brothers and sisters and I, I do communicate with a couple of them you know but uh it's tough because your everyday you know tasks you got to do and, and the kids to school and you know sure. the you know the cutting the grass and trimming the trees and, and you know and uh it's just people get busy with everyday life that it's it's hard to disconnect from those people that were there for you you know what i'm saying all the time that we're only getting older yeah and you know my oldest i think Sisters, probably. I don't. Sorry, sis, if I'm giving the wrong age, but I think 24, she's yeah, twenty four. I think she's close to her sixties. You know yeah. what I mean? But I mean, I'm forty three, so my baby brother's got to be at least thirty six. Yeah. So, I mean, I just I got to get better at that myself, and a lot of people are guilty of that. I think. You know, the day before we lost Daddy, I talked to Dad, and Dad does a good job of checking on the flock. Right. Is what he calls it. And uh, the day before we lost Daddy, Dad called me. And Dad said, have you talked to Eddie Joe Barber, Vidal? And I said, no, no, I haven't talked to anybody. We've been real busy with work. Yeah. I said, you know what? I get off at noon tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I said, I'll call all of them when I get out of work at noon tomorrow. Right. Well, Eddie died at 7 o'clock in the morning the next day. Oh, my God. And uh, I, I wish I had called the day before. I don't carry a lot of weight with that. You know, because I, I know me and I know Eddie knew what kind of relationship we had. I know Eddie knows that I loved him. Right. I know we had a lot of good times together. I wish for myself I had called Eddie. You know, but at the same time, it's kind of one of those things where, it's I find it especially now that we get older and we we start to attend more funerals and weddings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I find it where it's kind of like if somebody. You call and you want to do a podcast, like, hell yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Yeah. Let's do it next week. We ain't waiting. It's the yeah. no time around it. <laughs> oh, man. You know, and that's one thing that, you know, you get somebody in your head and, and it's kind of like, man, I haven't talked to them. my father-in-law. Let me let me call. Yeah. You know, let me call my mom or let me call my dad. Well, you know, one thing that was interesting when I did the podcast with my mom, my mom told me the other day, <coughs> before we did the podcast, she was like, I don't even really know my son. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know what? She doesn't, you know? I left George Woods when I was 19, 20. Yeah. And I've been trying to become independent and have a life of my own. And I'm 44. And I forgot to include her on a lot of stuff. Oh, man. You know? And yeah. so so now I understand, you know, I understand the importance of that. You know, the importance of reaching out to people and the importance of making that connection because we, we're not going to have them forever. You and, know? and that's another thing, too. Like, um, my mom passed away last year. Hmm. And and what you're saying is, is is very true. Uh there was times I'd get home from work and I was like, Man, I'm tired today, right? I'll go see mom tomorrow. You know. And uh my mom I, you know I, I told you earlier, they raised me since I was three months old. And my dad never spanked me, never talked to me in any kind of way. He should have. He <laughs> <laughs> he uh he just he, he was he, he got his 
discipline done just by looking at you. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Was there way. was nothing. My dad never whooped me once, gay. Okay? My dad spanked me a lot, but he could also look at me too. Now, I think my mom put me in a coma a couple of times. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She did CPR and woke me back up, but she hit you again. I was telling you, uh, but I, there was lots of times where I should have picked up that phone. You know, and those are the things I carry with me now. I should have gone over, had more breakfast, you know, time with her. I should have gone over and and did the lunch thing, you know, or the dinner thing. And I, I was there for my mom a lot, um, to the doctor visits, to the, you know, just this thing. Mom, you know, when I used to take her to the dialysis there towards the end, you know, she used to love picking up that menudo, you know, from the mm-hmm. Circle K. She loved that. So I was like, all right, I'm going to make it a special thing that when I take her, uh, I'm going to get her whatever she wants, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah, I think, you know, like you said, you know, losing Eddie. You know, Eddie was a, a wonderful dude, you know what I'm saying? Um, now, what kind of lessons do we have to carry with the siblings we still have available, you know, that are still alive? Like, yeah. do we learn from that? Or it's just one of those things where, okay, we lost somebody. Um, they're gone, so now we're just still not going to let do what we said we're gonna do you know so i think it's important like for me to i'm thank god luckily i still have all my brothers and sisters so i need to get better at that you know i I tell you what like we talked about it a while back and and uh man i struggled real bad when eddie at first passed and i still have my moments but you know eddie was with the five of us uh, I always say dad's the nucleus of our family, yeah. right? He had uh, uh, three kids, I mean, five kids, you know, three different women. Yeah. Dad's our nucleus. Man, you're putting him on blast, Dad man. was the Dad was, a, was the man. He was a player. He was, uh, oh, man. He was like Shaggy back in the day. <laughs> but uh, I heard a song coming down, and I was like, that reminds me of dad. But I couldn't say the song because he'd get upset. But uh, That's Papa uh, Bear right there, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay. But, you know, with the siblings, Eddie was the nucleus. Uh-huh. You know, I may go several weeks without talking to Vidal or Joe or Barbara, but and vice versa, but we yeah. always talk to Eddie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when Eddie passed, we went to the valley to go spread some ashes for him. And, uh, man, I had a real hard time. And, you know, I struggled with 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 him passing, of course. But it was kind of like, you know, I wasn't enjoying my time with the siblings that I had left. Right. Because I was so upset about the one that we lost. Mm-hmm. And I'm still upset about the one that we lost. But I, I every, you know, I regularly have to remind myself, hey, you need to reach out. And you need to enjoy your time with your siblings because it's it's not forever, man. You it's know, not, yeah. it, it, you know we need to enjoy that time and we need to make those memories. And in, and when we're in the moment, we need to be in the friggin' moment, yeah. man. So, who would you say is the nucleus of your siblings now? You know what? I, I would say Barbara. Barbara picked uh, up the task. I would say Barbara did. Oh man. Uh, you know when when Eddie passed, I, I wanted to replace him real bad. You know, yeah. and so I was like. You know, I was thinking, you know, man, his son, Matt, you know, we'll start including Matt on certain text messages. Or yeah. whatever. You know, we do. But, you know, it took me a while to realize that I didn't have to replace Eddie. Right. You know, uh, everybody still interacts with Barbara, you know, and, and uh, she's a lot less fun than Eddie, but she's a lot more masculine. <laughs> Don't listen to so. him, Barbara. <laughs> he, he didn't mean that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, again, just to kind of reiterate things that we've talked about today, you know, I, I think it's important that we make time for the people that we love. And, and you know, at a certain age, at a certain point, you start to realize what what matters, you know, and you can start cutting out the bullshit and not, you know, not uh, kind of living more in the moment and, and, and you know, keeping your, your core people tight and being available to people, you know, yeah. especially... Especially when when people are feeling hopeless, you know, yeah. if you can if you can lend a, a helping hand or a conversation or just a short time term distraction, you yeah. know, I've known a handful of people that have passed away because they've taken their own lives, and sometimes I sit there and I wonder, I'm like, if I've never been in that situation, but sometimes I wonder if if they would have just waited five more minutes, yeah, if would that have gotten them five more hours, if that would have gotten them five more days. Yeah. You know, if they would just would have waited a little bit longer, maybe that extreme hopelessness would have passed. Yeah. You know, and maybe maybe that doesn't work. You know, but if if you can be a, a 
be there for somebody going through that. Mm -hmm. You might be the opportunity that helps them get past that hopelessness, you know, and that need to to stop living. Right. You know, Uh, because, man, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's heartbreaking, and especially when it's somebody like you talked about that's close to you. Yeah. You know that that maybe something simple would have would have helped them get through another day, and maybe that day would have got them another ten years. Yeah. You know, you never know. But and see, and it's one of those things where um, I think in time, I hope it, the circle close comes. You know, all full full circle, I should say, and that we find a way to. If it's not me and you doing these podcasts, it's somebody else. Sure. But I hope somebody finds a way to put that information out. And even if we could just save one game. Yeah. One person. It's all that matters. You know, we, what matters is making a change in somebody's life. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've been there, and I know when the time gets dark, and like you said, you know, the hope is gone, and, and, and you're looking around, and you're like, man, these walls are closing in. You know, and it's like um, you got people talking to you and you just can't hear them. You got people looking at you, but you can't see them. You know, uh, you got people reaching their arm out, trying to get to you and you're just pushing them away. Um, it, it's it's a very lonely place to be. And I hope that in time there's a way where anybody that's going through those thoughts and those those hard times and, and that pain. That they can just reach their arm out, you know, open their eyes, listen, and just take the time, take the help, put the pride aside, and uh, give in. You got to. Because if not, like you said, it's going to be too late. Yeah. And uh, we'll just see. I mean, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, I did bring something I wanted to share with you. You know, I hadn't seen you in a while, but this coin yeah. right here... Uh, when you fly around in Iraq, they call it heroes. So when like an American gets killed, you got to fly them back in the helicopter. Mm-hmm. And you drape an American flag over their body, and you get these coins. You know, it's just not for flying heroes, but it's for other kind of missions. Well, this coin right here, I got with my buddy that committed suicide. Mm. Right? So I've got a bunch of different coins, but... I wanted to give you this one. I wanted you to have this because through this podcast, I think you're going to make a difference. And I think we are going to do find a way to help somebody. So I wanted to give you that. And I appreciate it. Keep that with you, you know what I'm saying? Hey, don't go pawn that, Gabe. Man, you know I'm, what I'm, I'm, on, I'm honored to have this, man. Yeah. I really do appreciate this. No, it's no problem, man. And I think, uh, I think, I think God that he helped you find your way, Yeah. you know? And uh, and I hope he continues to do that for others. And you know, I think he's going to use you too. Yeah. You know, whether you realize it or not, I think I think there's still more for you to do for people that are in need. You know, uh, because you've been there and you've yeah. carried the load before, so you know how heavy it is. You know, and it takes people like you to get people through situations. Yeah. You know, I appreciate that. And. Uh, well, whenever you find yourself in a hard time, like I said, you just keep that next to your bed. I kept it next to my bed for years, and, um, it, you know, you, you'll be fine. You'll be good. And we all, like you said, we all need that one person. And like I said, I, I knew I was coming here. We had talked in the past. I heard your podcast with James and your mom and, you know, different buddies you had. And I just, I thought it was important. And it just, this meeting didn't just happen because it was just going to happen. I think, you know, I was just. Thanks for having me, you know, and letting me give, me give me this opportunity to put my message out there. Well, I appreciate you reaching out, man. Yeah. And anytime you want to do it again, let's get back together, yeah. you know, and uh, maybe we'll have something figured out or lined up for people that, that they can start having something to, to be a part of. Right. You know, because there's a lot of people in need and more, more people than what we know, you know, and so hopefully well, they'll be more, more active and more vocal in their need. Yeah. You know? One one last thing. I don't know if you remember, but I don't know if it was a dream or not, but you remember when we were younger and we used to go stay at your place? Mm-hmm. And uh, your dad, we used to wake up and he'd be putting that holy water on our foreheads. Did that oh, really happen? He still does it. <laughs> he still does it. You don't see my greasy forehead right now? Uh, 
<laughs> I wanted to confirm that, man, because I told that, shared that story with my kids. And I was like, man, I think your da- Gabe's dad used to put double the holy water on my forehead. I tell you what, drive by the house right now. He's he's got he's got a whole vial full. <laughs> Whenever no. I bring my wife into town, I have them bless her mouth because she's very mouthy. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you better edit that out of this conversation, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll out of this it. podcast. I'll leave it. I've said it worse. <laughs> but I appreciate it, brother. No problem, Gabe. Like I said, thanks for having me. Maybe we could do this again. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Benny. No problem. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for listening to the Gabe Molina Podcast. 